Hello and welcome to the last of the films from the high level periodicity topic. This one again deals with complex ions um, but whereas in the previous film we introduced some of the key terms associated with complex ions, here we're going to be explaining why it is that complex ions are often coloured. Um, if you haven't watched the previous film or if you don't remember some of the key terms then I would recommend you go back to that before you start watching this one as you might get a little bit confused. But hopefully by the end of this film what you'll be able to do is understand that when ligands approach a central ion they're going to cause the energy of the orbitals in that ion to split and that once these orbitals have split electrons can move from one orbital to another in other words they can make transitions and in doing so they can absorb light and cause these compounds to be colored okay that might sound a little bit obscure at the moment so let's just try and illustrate it a little bit more clearly this electron configuration that's been drawn here is for an Fe2 plus ion. Okay? Now, hopefully you can figure out that iron has an electron configuration of argon in square brackets, which remember, we're not being encouraged to use that shortcut. Okay? And then 4s2, 3d6. So when iron forms a 2 plus ion and it loses these two electrons, we can see that this is going to be its electron configuration. It's going to have a 2 plus charge now, I suppose, by the time I've put that in, and it's going to have 6 d electrons. Now, you might remember that the electrons within a subshell will all have the same energy. They're called degenerate. This is true, but it ceases to be true when ligands approach a metal ion. Now, without going into the details of how the approach of the ligands along the Cartesian axes will interact with the differently orientated uh, d orbitals in different ways and cause some of their energies to rise and some to fall, okay, without worrying about any of that stuff because it's not tested or examined, although it's true. What we need to realize is that once a ligand has approached, the energy of these orbitals is going to change. Some are going to go up, some are going to go down, but most importantly, there is now an energy gap between these orbitals and those. Don't worry about how many there are top and bottom. Just understand that there is now where the d orbitals were degenerate, or the same energy before the ligand came along, and now have different energies. And what does this matter? you may ask. Well, if I had, like in the Fe2 plus ion, if I had six electrons in degenerate orbitals, and then a ligand or more than one ligand came along, so for example we might be dealing with uh, the hexa-aqua ion 2 complex, okay, which we learned as an example in the previous film. So this complex involves an iron 2 plus iron so the iron 2 has that electron configuration as soon as these wa sorry six waters come along and approach the electron um, orbitals will change in energy and the electrons will say to themselves well I'd like to go to the lower energy orbitals please okay in spite of the fact they have to pair up okay and now because they're down here we can excite these electrons in other words we can promote them to higher energies. And in order to do this, we have to provide exactly this amount of energy here. So in other words, the transition that is made by these electrons will absorb energy, and the amount of energy it will absorb will depend on the gap between these orbitals. And what's that energy linked to? Well, you might remember before when we were looking at um, the absorption and emission spectra of hydrogen, we said that the energy of light is related to its color. So in other words, if this ion was absorbing photons of a particular energy in order to promote these electrons, then the color of photons that it absorbed would depend on that energy gap. Right? So in other words, the color of light that a complex will absorb depends on the energy gap between its orbitals. And remember there is this relationship between the frequency of light and the energy of it, and that is that the energy of a photon is equal to Planck's constant times the frequency of the light. Okay, Which isn't an important formula to be able to use, 
but it is important to realize that the frequency of light is related to the energy and therefore the color of the light is related to the energy. Now what does that mean for what we see? Well as it happens we see the complementary color of that which is absorbed. So this wheel here is kind of, uh, I've put it here to kind of help us understand what we mean by complementary colors. These, uh, this is supposed to be the electromagnetic spectrum arranged in a way that shows the three primary colors, red, green, and blue. Notice these might be different to the colors you're taught of primary colors in art. Okay? And when you mix all of these colors together, you get white light. If you mix red and green together, you get yellow. And yellow is the complementary color of blue. So in other words, the color that is opposite another color here is its complementary color. So if you kind of, uh, I suppose, red and green mixed together making yellow is a little bit counterintuitive sometimes. But if you remember that there is red, green, and blue as the primary colors, red mixed with blue is kind of purple or magenta, which is quite, quite intuitive. And uh, blue mixed with green is turquoise or greeny blue then what's left is yellow. So yellow is the complementary color of blue. So if my complex absorbed yellow light, it would appear blue. If my complex absorbed green light, it would appear to be a magenta color, and so on and so forth. Okay? So now, moving on to what we might say if we encountered an exam question, because we've got to make quite a lot of points here. A common question to see is, explain the origin of colour in complex ions. Well, we'd start off by making the point that ligands cause splitting of d orbital energy levels, right? So this is the first thing that we said, that as ligands approach, the energy levels of the d orbitals are split. How much they're split depends on the ligand, also depends on the cation in the centre. But once these orbitals are split, electrons can absorb light. Because remember, the absorbing light will promote them from a lower energy orbital to a higher one. Okay? And the energy gap between the orbitals corresponds to the frequency of the light absorbed. And the frequency of the light absorbed is related to the color that's absorbed. And we end up seeing the complementary color of that color. So it's kind of five points that you have to make if you get this relatively innocent looking question in an exam. Right, here's a couple of things for you to ponder as we kind of finish the topic. Hopefully, um, your understanding is good enough that you can understand why it is that these two compounds that contain copper 2 ions, why one is blue, that is to say it's coloured, okay, so hydrated copper sulphate is blue, it's got a colour, but anhydrous copper sulphate is white, it doesn't have a colour. In other words, it doesn't absorb any colors of light. And also zinc, which remember we said was a D-block element, but not a transition metal. Zinc doesn't form colored compounds, but copper does. And it's not good enough just to say, because zinc is a transition metal. Try and think about what's going on with the electrons there. And notice that copper 1 compounds are not colored, whereas copper 2 compounds are. That might give you a little hint about where to go there. Now, um, obviously you don't have to answer those questions, but if you get completely stuck on them and you've got no idea where to go with them, or if you've got any questions about this higher level periodicity topic or this particular film, or any comments that you'd like to make, please feel free to come and see me, and even better, because it allows other people to see the, your, your brilliant questions for an eternity, or maybe not an eternity, but for, for some time after, post a comment on YouTube.